Landing gear retracted. Individuals, Albert Esro. I may not be religious, but I still have faith. Not the kind my parents have. In fact, I don't think their desperate devotion can even be called faith. The point of faith is that it's tested. And if you insist that your beliefs are above criticism or analysis... All clear to save troubles, Commander. I suppose. I don't believe in absolute evil, only in the iniquity that emerges when understanding fails. I believe intelligence. Naturally tend towards cooperation rather than conflict, not because there's a higher power guiding our decisions, but because that's simply the most logical course. And yes, our recent experiences with the Thargoids have tested that faith harshly. Albert Tessero. Professor Albert Tessero is an Imperial scientist, an affiliate of the Akinar Research Council, and a founding member of the Joint Superpower Initiative Aegis, which was established in August 3303 to investigate the Thargoid menace. She currently serves as Aegis's head of research. Tessero's biological parents were members of the Besmeratu cult, an isolationist group secreted within a sealed compound that believed itself to have been chosen for salvation by non-human beings. The cult's charismatic leader, Anton Hotep, claimed humanity had been under the protection of these beings for millennia, that he was their cosmic messiah, and that only the believers would be saved from the coming apocalypse. In support of these claims, he often produced alien artifacts, allegedly sourced from archaeological digs that other cult members were never permitted to examine closely. Alba was marked as a troublemaker from an early age due to her heretical belief in rationality and the scientific method. She was formally banished from Besmeratu after she sabotaged the air purifying system, forcing the compound to call for help from outsiders and thus humiliating Hotel. After her story became public knowledge, she was adopted into the household of Senator Olivia Tesro of Akana and awarded a scholarship to study in Grand Imperial alongside the children of the nobility. She wrote her master's thesis on the potential uses of mathematics as a lingua franca between human beings and intelligent non-humans. She's passionately interested in non-human intelligence and meaningful discourse between species. Despite the counterfeit alien contact myths of her early life, or perhaps because of them, she is determined to do whatever she can to act as a bridge between human and non-human cultures. Individuals are con delay. I'll tell you, Delane is the most trustworthy cuss you could ever work with. Why? Because he always makes good on his threats. Anyone else tells you that they're gonna cut off your index fingers and hammer them into your sinuses with your own summer foot? You know, it's just bluster. But if the lane tells you that, you know he'll do exactly what he says. To the letter. He wants people to be afraid of him, and that means he keeps his promises. You gotta respect that. Mantle Hoek, arms trader. Archon Delane is the head of the Chemo crew, a powerful criminal syndicate. He refers to himself as the Pirate King, a title not recognized by any government. Delane's early life is not documented, and there are competing legends of his origin. Some believe he grew up in a drug den on one of the frontier worlds where he learned to fight. Other stories have been working as a bouncer in the brothel where he was born, or training as a grease monkey at an orbital shipyard that hosted clandestine arena fights after hours. What is certain is that Delane challenged and slaughtered the reigning pirate lord of the Cuma crew when he was only 15. The title of pirate lord is only transferred on the death of the incumbent, either to a nominated successor or to the victim of a ritual challenge. According to tradition, the pirate lord must 
must honor any challenge to his leadership, regardless of who issues it. Although the choice of weapons... Orbital flight engaged. In Delane's case, Pirate Lord Crab opted for a bare hands contest, a highly unusual choice. It has been suggested that Crab saw Delane as a weak target due to his albinism, unworthy of the Pirate Lord's personal attention. It is possible that Crab intended to give Delane a beating rather than kill him outright. If so, it was a fatal act of mercy. Footage of the fight shot by onlookers shows Delane deftly evading Crab's heavy blows, allowing the larger man to tie him. Himself out before delivering a sudden jab to Crab's eye. Delane then battered Crab into submission, continuing to pummel the body until it was unrecognizable. The Kimo crew immediately split, dividing itself into those who saw Delane as a legitimate leader and those who refused to follow her proven youth. The rift was soon closed, however, as Delane proved himself as capable of leader as he was a fighter. in purpose and more organized than ever before, the Cumo crew quickly became the terror of the Pegasus sector, absorbing lesser pirate gangs, raiding civilian stations with power plant capacity exceeded, and taking over corporate facilities. In delayed power plant capacity exceeded. Early years of leadership, many rival pirate lords demanded the right to one-on-one -on -one combat. Each of them convinced that they would be the one to strike him down and take over his enviable criminal empire. Delane met each challenger in turn, agreed to their choice of weapons, and promptly dispatched them. After the death of Pirate Lord Horvath, who Delane strangled with his own razor whip, there were no further challenges. Delane and his Kumo crew ruled by fear, but they operate according to strict rules. If a settlement in Kumo territory has paid its tribute, any Kumo pirate foolish enough to raid it risks being stripped of his rank, his crew, his possessions, his skin, and his life, according to the severity of the offense. These are the infamous five strippings, instigated by Delane as a standard punishment across Kumo territory. Individuals Arissa Lavini Duval. I am a daughter, not just of the Emperor, but of the Empire. And I look upon our traditions and achievements with pride. I hold, as my forefathers did, that to be born Imperial is to receive the blessings of the universe. That is the true meaning of the ceremonial wine tipped upon our newborn heads. Does this pride in our heritage make the old-fashioned? Some would say so. I know that there are those in my family who cannot bear the burden of rank and privilege without a chronic sting of guilt. But I ask that you look charitably upon those so ailing as I do. After all, rebellion is the prerogative of adolescence. I ask that you reserve your anger for a worthier target. For those who acknowledge our traditions in public, but privately serve only their own corrupt interests. For those who exploit their ancestors' sacrifices while holding our military in contempt. For all the petty, venal, spineless parasites in our very midst. I have sat with many such parasites, and for form's sake, I have masked my contempt.
But that mask has served its purpose, and now I cast it aside. To the worms nestling so complacently in the heart of my beloved empire, I say this. We see you, and we are coming for you. Arissa Lavinie Duval, private speech given at her post-coronation dinner. Arissa Lavinie Duval is the reigning emperor, having been appointed to the position by the Imperial Senate and a direct descendant of the first emperor, Henson Duval. Her father was originally thought to be the late Prince Aristide de Lavinie, but Arissa's claim to be the illegitimate daughter of Emperor Hengist Duval has since been ratified by DNA testing. Arissa distinguished herself as a serving senator early in life. Unlike other senators who took their patron support for granted or left the work of intercession to a delegated representative, Arissa made a point of visiting and speaking directly with her patrons. Foremost among her concerns was how little scope for mobility the empire offered. In theory, it was possible to rise in rank, but in reality, power was hoarded and loyal service went un To her mother's horror, Arissa proceeded to go undercover as a slave in the Lagany household on Akana, talking to the staff and listening in on meetings. What she learned would change her view of the empire forever. The rules could be broken with impunity, so long as the proper bribes were paid. A senator's favor could be secured, a corporation's accounts could be doctored, and an atrocity could be covered up for the right price. On paper, it might be a patronage system, but in operating, it's a de facto plutocracy. Arissa's experience as a slave also cemented her own view of imperial slavery, namely that it was no worse than indentured servitude. Non-imperial commentators responded by pointing out that slaves in noble households on Akana could hardly be held up as typical examples of slavery. Frameship drive charging. Disengaging on four, three, two, one, engage. And that Arissa might have learned more had she spent her time in a Mastopolis mining facility. Arissa has made no secret of her determination to restore the rule of law within the Empire. She means to purge it of corruption and has received widespread public support. Unlike her niece, Ashling Deval, she sees the Empire system as inherently worthy, if impeded by long-term neglect. They need to be cleansed, not torn down and rebuilt, as per Ashling's wishes. As the first woman to serve as emperor, Arissa is a controversial figure to many, regardless of her personal political stance. Many hardcore traditionalists within the empire have vowed to depose her and replace her with a ruler more to their liking. Individuals, Denton Patrias, what disgusts me? That's a perceptive question. By asking it, you reveal that you consider me a man of taste. If you'd asked me what I hated, I'm not sure I could have hidden my disappointment in such a banal question. Frame shift drive charging. But disgust, that deserves an answer. Hmm. It's jealousy that most disgusts me. It's such a pitfall. Three, two, one. Engage. Empty, self-defeating emotion. I see it every day. Most men look at me and think, I want what he has. Perhaps one of the thousand thinks, how can I achieve what he achieved? Now, he's not jealous. He's motivated. Who knows, we might work together one day, but most men are not like that. They have the desire. Frame shift drive charging. But 
not the initiative. It's like a dog watching you eat and wishing he was a human. And that's the tragic thing about jealous people. They think they hate me. system that wants to be independent, and on the other you have the oppressive federation telling them no. The authorities in Rune put out a call for aid, and what did the Alliance do? We turned them down. That would never have happened on the Holos, would it? I would have been at the head of the Alliance fleet, taking down the Fed Cap ship with a well-aimed torpedo of the tail pipe. But life isn't like the Holos. You need political and legal clarity. When Lu asked for our help, who exactly was doing the asking? The people? All right then, which people? Who counted their votes and how was the process monitored? Was their decision an informed one or were they bombarded with propaganda? The friendship drive charging. Science is rigorous, you see. You can't join a voluntary association of free systems unless you can offer demonstrable proof of your freedom to choose, just as you can't enter into a contract with us. Being a sound mind, acting without coercion. Edmund Mahon, 
responding to a question from Jessica Braganza, one of a party of school children visiting Prime Minister's residence. Edmund Mahon is the current Prime Minister of the Alliance. Fuel scooping. The product of a corn farming family based on Birmingham in the DSO system, Mahon was hardworking and shrewd from an early age, with a particular talent. Fuel scoop disengaged. Negotiate. Frame shift drive charging. Nobody seemed able to beat his crop prices down, and he always managed to shave something off the asking price of any tools or machinery the family needed. In the first book of his autobiography, The Shadow of Silence, Four, three, two, one. Seven, he attributes this talent to preparatory research, claiming that he always found out as much as he could about the people he would be dealing with before meeting them. At 18, Mahon won a federal scholarship Frustrated with what he saw as the imbalance of power between corporations and their employees, fuel scooping. Mahon intended to specialize in cases of corporate exploitation. He quickly found, however, fuel scoop disengaged. That the legal profession was not to his liking. Awash with duplicity, double talk, and corruption was his assessment. And he switched track to political science. Two years into his course, and following an increasingly vocal series of broadcasts on a personal video channel in which he argued in favour of the newly formed alliance, Mahon's scholarship funds were abruptly cut off. He had unknowingly violated a clause that required him to refrain from public criticism of the federal government. Unwilling to return to his family without having made something of himself, Mahon had no choice but to look for work while continuing to study. The bar in which he had spent so many hours Power plant capacity exceeded. as a student was happy to take him on as a bartender. And he proved so competent that after his graduation, he took on the role of manager. Mahon claims it was this experience, rather than any innate idealism, that set him on the path to becoming a career politician. As he puts it, a good bartender has to be able to listen and to give equal respect to everyone while demanding that others do the same. He has to be able to distinguish what is meant from what is said, encourage free exchange of views while tactfully enforcing the rules, and, when necessary, break up fights. Mahon's break into politics came when his friends encouraged him to run for city office against the favoured corporate candidate, Jensen Crane. The Mahon campaign began as a token protest, since Crane was expected to win by a comfortable majority. Mahon eviscerated Crane in the live debates, however, winning over the audience with a combination of wry humour and an empathetic awareness of local concerns that Crane could not hope to match, living as he did in a high-altitude apartment complex. Crane was elected by a narrow margin, but Mahon's supporters begged him to continue in politics. So it was that, at the age of just 27, Mahon found himself working alongside elder statesperson Irene Mendel helping with a campaign to break the DSO system away from the Federation and make it a part of the Alliance. By the time DSO joined the Alliance in 3286, Mahon was a seasoned parliamentarian. He served as a planetary representative several times before making his bid for the Premiership. Individuals, Felicia Winters. Paul.
we heard it once again. It is the insinuation that to seek a diplomatic solution is weak. That a preference for discussion over conflict means we're afraid to fight. We are accustomed to this, of course. We've heard the president's supporters pervert our words again and again. When we face up to the Federation's previous wrongs, they mock us for our so-called liberal guilt. When we celebrate a detente between the superpowers that will help us oppose the Thargoid menace, they imply that we are traitors. But it is they who are afraid, and with good reason. Because the people of the Federation have had enough. They will no longer be manipulated into reckless conflicts that serve only to fatten the wallets of the arms dealers and the privileged. They will no longer pretend that Hudson's tub thumping and saber rattling is anything more than vacuous propaganda. From star to star, Connolly to complex, satellite to station, we hear the same heartfelt cry. Let the mistakes of the past remain in the past, and let the Federation embrace only the best of itself. Let us return to the core values of hard work, honest trade, support. Power plant capacity exceeded. Support for the vulnerable and... Power plant capacity exceeded. Mutual respect. The people are ready for us. Let us be ready for them. Felicia Winters, Liberal Party Annual Address, 3303. Felicia Winters is the head of the Liberal Party of the Federation and as such serves as ex officio shadow president opposite President Zachary Hudson of the Republican Party. Winters was born and raised on Taylor Colony, one of the oldest human colonies, and worked for the Sirius Corporation before going into politics full time at the age of 44. Her current role was thrust upon her unexpectedly. Prior to 3301, Winters was Secretary of State to then President Jasmina Halsey. When both Halsey and Vice President Ethan Naylor went missing aboard Starship One, Winters became Acting President. The assumption of this responsibility left her visibly shaken, and despite her popularity in Congress, it was widely felt that she was not up to the job. The Liberal Party was in a state of crisis at the time following the Lou conflict. A group of forces had sought to make the Lou system independent from federal control, prompting a declaration of war from the Federation. Many of the party's supporters were shocked by President Halsey's decision to open fire on refugee ships during the conflict. According to reports, Winters had questioned the action, arguing passionately with her friend Halsey behind closed doors while maintaining a front of public... Power plant public capacity exceeded. Solidarity. Consequently, she found herself responsible for a party whose voter base had largely deserted it and whose values had slipped out of alignment with her own. Shortly after Halsey's disappearance, Zachary Hudson called for an emergency vote of no confidence that he resoundingly won, resulting in his appointment to the role of president. Given the massive support for Hudson and the disarray among the Liberals, Winters was expected to resign and let the Liberal Party rebuild itself from the ground up. Instead, she threw herself into her work, leading efforts to persuade various systems not to defect to the Alliance and distributing aid packages to planets in need. Her energetic and proactive approach led to fresh support for both her and her party, and she currently rivals Hudson in the popularity stakes. Individuals Hengist Duval Hengist Duval, 1163 to 3301, was the 15th ruler of the empire. He was assassinated.